Um, I kept going back and forth with a couple of pa um, a couple of passages and a couple of um, uh, sermons for this evening, but we're going to actually be in Judges chapter six, and we're going to be going over a, a couple of passages in in Judges. Um, there are a lot of characters through the Bible that we, and especially even this morning, we were talking about Joshua. And different, different men and different women of the Bible, they, they either challenge you in the, the aspect of what to do, and oftentimes some of them kind of give you instruction on what not to do. Gideon is a man in which that is kind of both. Um, he gets it right sometimes, he gets it wrong sometimes. But the funny thing is, is Gideon is very, not, not just realistic, but Gideon is very relatable. Um, it's so easy to find ourselves living a life like Gideon to where there are times in our lives where we're, we're quite not doing what it is that God wants us to do, and, and sometimes we, we are. But Gideon is um, an interesting study and, and someone I, I always kind of look to um, in the aspect of, of finding courage um, when, when times are difficult. And there's, there's a lot of other uh, men and women in the Bible I, I like to look to, but uh, Gideon is special, especially, and I'm not sure why, I, I do like looking at Gideon's story to, to kind of encourage myself to, to, to kind of reach in and, and find the courage that God has put in us to have to accomplish great things that he has planned for us. Now Gideon is, is an interesting person for a couple of different reasons. Gideon has 100 verses dedicated to his story. Now this is interesting because it's more than any other judge in the Bible. So the funny thing is, is you take judges and you actually look at the amount that's divided for each of these judges that come out, Gideon actually has the largest amount dedicated to his account. Gideon is the only judge that we see this personal struggle of, of faith and courage. Um, you do see a, a, couple of other, a couple other judges uh, have a journey through their um, the, what it is that God has them to do, but the funny thing is, is Gideon's really the only one that you see this internal struggle that he has. He, he wants to have faith in God, but he lets his circumstances um, prevent him from doing what it is that God wants him to do. He is a great encouragement to all those that struggle with doubt, are stressed, are burdened down. Um, those that see themselves as, as never having enough for God and pressured by others to do something other than what God wants them to do. Gideon is a good person to study and, and read and, and to consider. Now we're going to start our journey with Gideon here in Judges chapter 6, starting in verse 11. And it says, And there came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak which was in or uh, uh, Ophrah, that pertained unto Joash the Abezerite, uh, and his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. Now, when we come into this scene and we're introduced to what's going on, we find out a few things. Israel was in dire straits at this time. First of all, they, they got themselves into a mess. Judges chapter 6, 1 says that the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of, the Midian, uh, of Midian seven years. So we begin to see the cycle that Gideon is in the middle of where God raises up a, a group to, to uh, punish and, and to, um, to chastise Israel, and that's the Midians for seven years. And every year during the harvest, the Midianites would come to Israel to pillage. So we're, we're going year after year after year of the Midians coming in and, and pillaging and, and almost forcing Israel to start over. 
And that's going to put a damper on, I mean, it's the harvest. It's going to put a damper on everything. If people don't have food, if people don't have food, how are they going to do anything else? I mean, it's hard to be a blacksmith when you're, you're starving for food and trying to find something to sustain yourself. It's hard to, to do anything if you don't have uh, food and sustenance. The, Israel, uh, the Israelites would actually hide in caves, mountains, and strongholds. God did not intend for that. God did not have that um, plan for Israel. They purposely furnished and built up a hiding place. I mean, how sad is that? Oh, we know the Midianites are going to come back again. We need to, you know, put the good couch in the, the, the cave, okay? All right, hon, we need, to put the, we need to put the good china in the cave. So when the Midianites, we can, you know, at least have some good, you know, some good things to have in the cave and make ourselves comfortable while they're doing their thing. They purposely furnished and built up hiding places. Not a plan B, but cowardly ran into a hole to hide. The Hebrew word is only found one time in the Old Testament, and it would be a hole of dubiousness. The Hebrew language literally defines it in the sense of a hole of cowardice. When we actually, um, uh, and, that, and looking into when it describes the, the mountains and the caves and the strongholds, the Midianites would gather together a coalition an alliance with the enemies of Israel to, to pillage and destroy. So it wasn't just the Midianites. The Midianites were starting to gather other people that hated the Israelites. I mean, good night. It's almost like having the big bully and then bully B, bully C, bully D coming into the group too. I mean, one bully's bad enough when you got a gang of them. I mean, good night. That's the that's worst nightmare situation for a school kid. The Midianites in their, their posse would destroy cattle, sheep, harvests, and Canaan as a whole. God describes Israel as impoverished. What a shame, for they were meant for so much greater, were they not? So we see Israel and we see Gideon in this state of, of cowardice. Now, to get themselves out of this, and we see this transformation in Gideon's life, it wasn't overnight. And it wasn't like Gideon was lifting weights and like getting ready for battle and, and shining the armor and sharpening the sword when the angel of the Lord, or angel, was it the angel of the Lord? I don't, I don't want to misquote that. The um, Yeah, it was an angel of the... Uh, the angel of the Lord. So this is actually a Christophany. So the funny thing is, is Jesus himself comes to, to Gideon. Not only was it just an angel, but it was the angel. It was Christ himself came to Gideon, thou mighty man of valor. Me? Gideon? So there is a, a battle that first takes place in Gideon's, um, in his life, the, the battle through cowardice. cowardice. One of the first things you realize about Gideon is that he comes off as a, as a grade A scaredy cat. Throughout the whole first chapter of this great story is full of doubt and questions. In fact, if we start in, in Judges chapter 6, verse 13... Read down to 16, it says, And Gideon said unto him, O oh my Lord, if, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? And where be all his miracles, which our fathers told us, uh, us of, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. And the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? And he said unto him, O my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. It, it blows my mind because 
first of all, Gideon himself blames God for the situation they're in. But it wasn't God that turned his back on Israel. It was Israel that had turned their back on God. He was found hiding in a wine press trying to thresh wheat, which doesn't work. A wine press is an actual tub in which they apply pressure to the grapes and the, the juice comes out. Uh, a, when a threshing floor, a, a, a place where you thresh wheat, is actually the complete opposite. While a wine press is something recessed, the threshing floor is actually something that's set up, up above. Usually upon a hill or, or something to where there's active wind that comes over and it's open. It, you can't stand on a, a threshing floor. You can't thresh wheat without people around you seeing you do it. But the funny thing is, is he was hiding, trying to thresh wheat in the wine press. And the reason they need wind is the chaff. So when you break wheat, the chaff comes and blows off in the wind. It's kind of like when you're eating peanuts. Okay, you crack open a peanut, you got all the dust, you got the flakes, you got the shell. That stuff blows off real easy. But that peanut, it's not going anywhere. The same thing with wheat. They thresh it and they beat the wheat. So the chaff, the stuff you don't want, the, the, not the kernel, but the, the, the chaff, whisks away in the wind, left behind, leaving behind the meat. But if you're inside a wine press, guess what you don't have? You ain't got wind. So he was making the, the job so much harder for himself because he was afraid. He looked so lowly of himself. Who? Me? You talking to me? Gideon almost seemed to hate himself. I'm the reject of my... Uh, I'm the reject of the, the worst family, the, the, the smallest family, and the, in, the most insignificant tribe of Israel, which in all honesty, one of the nation's greatest generations of cowards. I mean, Israel at the time wasn't doing so hot. His cowardice was a manifestation of his doubt in God. He first of all blamed God in verse 13. He requires the first miracle and sign from God in verses 17 and 21. God tells him, I'm going to do this great thing. And he says, prove it. I ain't doing anything until you prove it. God's not afraid of a challenge, first of all. We find many times in the word of God that he welcomes a challenge. But it does come with consequences when we don't take his word on faith. He receives a vision from God. So not only does he require a sign and a miracle, he receives a vision from God and accomplishes this task at night because he was afraid his father and the men of the city um, would do something. So he's, he's given a task to destroy the, the, the altars. And what he does is he waits until night to accomplish this goal. He should have had enough faith in God knowing that he'll protect him to go out in the middle of day and destroy those altars. But he was still scared. He was, he was, starting, to, he was starting to accomplish some things for God, but he was still kind of pulling back a little bit. Well, I, okay, I'll do it, but you know what? I'm, I'm going to do it this way. And, and, uh, going to sneak around a few things. He is delivered... And you can see God delaying any harm take place on Gideon while Midian and its coalition were gathering verses, uh, going through verses 28 and 33. And I'm, I'm just kind of skimming, skimming over a couple of events. The Spirit of God comes upon Gideon and he begins to gather an army out of nowhere in verses 34 to 35. So these are some amazing things that God starts doing with Gideon. And after all of this, Gideon still has to have God repeat himself and make one more promise with yet another miracle. Verses 36 and 40. So all of these things happen. And we'll, we'll go ahead and read this last part right here. It says, And Gideon said unto God, If thou wilt save Israel by mine hand, as thou hast said, behold, I will put a fleece of wool in the floor, 
And if the dew be on the fleece only, and it be dry upon the earth beside, then shall I know that thou wilt save Israel by mine hand, as thou hast said. And it was so, for he rose up early in the morrow, and thrust the fleece there uh, together, and wringed the dew out of the fleece a bowl full of water. And Gideon said unto God, Let not thine anger be hot against me, and I will speak but this once. Let me prove, I pray thee, but this once with the fleece, let it now be dry only upon the fleece, and upon, uh, upon all the ground let there be dew. And God did so that night, for it were dry upon the fleece only, and there was dew on all the ground. How sad and pathetic is it? Gideon had a, a miracle after miracle after miracle happen. God provided time and time and time again. God protected him time and time and time again. And he's like, all right, if I flip this coin 50 times and I get 49 heads and one tail, I know that you want me to do this. How silly. And too many people choose not to take God at his word. I mean, doesn't, doesn't God know what he's doing? But yet we act like he doesn't. Won't God take care of us? Yet we prepare like he won't. Does God not keep his promises? But yet we, we don't keep ours. When servants of God heard or received a promise of God, they took it to the bank. Like we were talking about, Joshua didn't need more from God to trust him. God told him to do something. Guess what Joshua did? He went and did it. Did Daniel and the three Hebrew children need more signs from God to not eat of the king's meat or his cup? Did the three Hebrew children need another sign to not answer the king carefully? It's not like the three Hebrew children like, all right, huddle up real quick. Should we do it? No. They all in unison knew exactly what they were supposed to do. Did Stephen need another sign from God as he was stoned to death as he was preaching and forgave them? Did Paul and Silas need another sign from God as it seemed like everything was going wrong through the first missionary journey? Good night. You want to you wanna look at the missionary journeys? The first missionary journey just seemed like failure after failure after failure. I mean, I'm surprised... They went out of the second missionary journey after the first one. I'll be honest, if it was me, I don't know if I would have had that faith to complete, just to be completely transparent. But they knew what God wanted them to do. It wasn't the result they were looking for. They were looking for God. Sadly, Gideon, like many Christians, need a sign from God to live a holy, separated, God-fearing, Bible-reading, prayer closet, and righteous-filled life. 2 Timothy 1.7, which has become a favorite verse of mine, for God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Um, not, not that I've, I mean, I've talked about it recently and whatnot. I am, my, one of my goals is to do 5K runs every day for 30 days. And I'm thinking I'm probably going to do it for three months straight. The reason I do it is because of that verse because of for, uh, 2 Timothy 1.7. Now, granted, yes, I need to lose weight. I need to be healthy. And I'm thinking long term, I want to be around for Aubrey. I want to be able to, to see her graduate high school. I want to walk her down the aisle. I mean, I'm not going to be able to do that if I'm 350 pounds and, and dead by I'm 45. Don't, don't listen to me, Amanda. Don't, don't, don't listen. I'm, I'm taking active steps to improve that. But one of the biggest reasons I'm staying disciplined to do this is because we're told, for God had not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. When you study the Greek of a sound mind, a sound mind is talking of a disciplined mind. And I want to be a disciplined person. And that's one of the reasons why I'm, I'm one of the biggest reasons I'm doing this 5K run for 30 days and very possibly um, three months straight. My legs don't like it. My body don't like it. Don't doubt in the dark what God told you in the light. It's 
a lot easier to stay committed to the hard times when you make the, the commitment when God has made it clear. Security, uh, security walking through the... Um, I'm, I'm, that's a typo. So the, not only was there a battle through um, cowardice, there's a battle through circumstances. Finally, Gideon, uh, Gideon had given it to God and was willing to follow his, his lead and promises, but now, um, now that he was willing to live by faith, he was going to have to have his faith tested. Judges chapter 1 through 8 says, Then Jerubbabel, who is Gideon, and all the people that were with him, rose up early and pitched beside the well of Haran, so that the host of the Midianites were on the north side of them by the hill of Morah, in the valley. And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, Mine own hand hath saved me. Now therefore go to proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. And there returned of the people twenty and two thousand, and there remained ten thousand. And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people are yet too, um, are yet too many. Bring them down unto the water, and I will try them for uh, thee there. And it shall be that of whom I say unto thee, This shall go with thee. And the same shall go with thee, and of whomsoever I say unto thee, this shall not go with thee, and the same shall not go. So he brought down the people under the water, and the Lord said unto Gideon, Every one that lappeth of the water with his tongue as a dog lappeth, him shalt thou set by himself. Likewise, every one that boweth down unto his knees to drink, and the number of them that lapped, putting their hand to their mouth, were three hundred men. But all the rest of the people bowed down upon their knees to drink water. And the Lord said unto Gideon, By the three hundred men that lapped I will save you, and deliver the Midianites into thine hand, and let all the other people go every man unto his place. So the people took victuals in their hand and their trumpets, and he sent all the rest of Israel, every man unto his tent, and retained those three hundred men. And the host of Midian was beneath him in the valley." This is quite an interesting turn of events. Usually they're always trying to keep the army together, are they not? Watch any war movie or read any story or book about war and battle. They're always trying to bolster the, the, the army. They're always trying to, if you know anyone else that wants to fight for the cause, have him join. But the funny thing is, is we have the complete opposite happen for Gideon. He starts with this amazing army that, man, it was guaranteed victory. But yet, God's there's too many of you. There's too, there's too many of you. You guys are going to take the credit, okay? Gideon is on fire in this chapter. Tells those that are afraid to leave. If you're afraid, leave. Tuck tail and, and run. I can't remember the last time I've heard... I mean, I'm, did George Washington say that at some point in time? No. I'm pretty sure uh, uh, Napoleon, nah, that was never something he would ever tell any of his men. Alexander the Great, no. The funny thing is, is Gideon, Gideon was told, you're afraid, leave, we have no room for you. Tell those that are not observant, that would put their mouth down to the water and lap up, their, up with, with their tongues, that you leave, you're not observant, you're not paying attention to your surroundings. Only the men that bring the water up to them so they can see and drink. It was kind of that picture of those that are paying attention to their surroundings may stay. And the 300 prepared for the journey and prepared for the battle. Taking food and lanterns with them. Gideon's victory was not found in his wit but his victory was found in God's promise to provide and protect. He receives a tip from a dream, and the Lord guides him through one of the greatest tactics we could have ever seen. It wasn't a divide and conquer, but divide and confuse. And what they, would, they, um, they had done, they had surrounded the, the camp, 
and they had taken they had taken the um, the the lanterns and the the um, the trumpets, which would signify that there was a division of 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 men. So these three hundred men were by the Midianite sight would have represented, hey, there's for every light I see, there's ten or a hundred other men with that one single man. So the funny thing is, is Gideon comes up, breaks the, the lantern so the Midianites could see it, blow the trumpet, it's the middle of the night. Not only are the Midianites confused because they woke up from their slumber, but they're surrounded by what looks like tens if not hundreds of thousands of men faith is commonly called blind faith is commonly called blind sadly we have brought this into this misleading narrative in Christianity faith isn't blind James 1 6 tells us but let him ask in faith nothing wavering for he that wavereth is like a wave of sea driven with the wind and tossed. Mark 9, 23, Jesus pay, uh, uh, said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. Romans 1, 17, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, The just shall live by faith. Hebrews eleven six, But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of of them that diligently seek him. Faith isn't blind. Faith, faith isn't blind. We are challenged to step out on faith, but faith requires some unknown element of, of course. If the Bible of my life has, has taught me anything about faith, that the only way we grow in faith is by being stretched and relying on the promises of God. Faith requires a storm. Faith requires a void. Faith requires a burden with no cure. Faith requires pain. Faith requires the dark. If we had all the answers laid out right in front of us to where we could go up and God told us the car to buy, we wouldn't have faith. There is an unknown element, but it's not blindness. We're not blind going through this. R.A. Torrey says, if we are to have real faith, we must study the word of God and discover what is promised. Then we must simply believe the promises of God. Trying to believe something that you want to believe is not faith. Believing what God says in his word is faith. Now there's a battle through cowardice. There's a... a, a battle through uh, circumstances, but there's a battle through compromise. Now we know the story of Gideon, Gideon being a coward. We know the story of Gideon going through the battle and, and finding victory, but there is a battle that, vi that Gideon faces and fails. Sadly, while the previous chapter covers Gideon winning the war, it covers, Gideon's lose, uh, it, it covers Gideon losing the victory. He had the victory in his grasp and then wasted the opportunity that he had been given. Judges 8.4 says, And Gideon came to Jordan and passed over he and the 300 men and were with him, faint yet pursuing them. That's a passage I love. They were faint yet pursuing. They still had a job at hand to take care of. Gideon was tenacious in getting the job done at this point. And this is a complete 180 from what we saw before. And it wasn't Gideon that did this. This is God working in him that transformed his life. Sadly, it would cost him something, though. Even though he was abandoned and rejected, he returned suit. He would further divide the wedge between him and other tribes, and, and there's a lot of backstory because the, there starts, Gideon starts to, to um, have some inner fighting with some of the tribes, and, and he, he starts to lose focus and starts to waver. Judges 8, 21 to 24 says, let me actually turn there real quick. And 
eight twenty one to twenty four, then Zeba and Zel uh, Zalmana uh, Zal said, "Rise thou and fall un upon us, for as the man is, so is his strength." And Gideon arose and slew Zeba and Zalmana and took away the ornaments that were on their camels' necks. Then the men of Israel said unto Gideon, Rule thou over us, that, uh, both thou and thy son, and thy son's son also, for thou hast delivered us from the hand of the Midian. And Gideon said unto them, I will not rule over you, neither shall my son rule over you. Or, or over you. The Lord shall rule over you. And Gideon said unto them, I would desire a request of you, that ye would give me every man the earrings of his prey, for they had golden earrings, because they were Ishmaelites. Gideon would miss the point. He, yes, drove out the Midianites. He did not lead them back into good standing with God. Judges were not only supposed to drive out those chastising Israel, but they were to they were supposed to lead the nation into peace, and Gideon was like, I'm good, thanks though. He accomplishes the first portion of driving them out, but then must judge, must a uh, much get uh, supposed to give them leadership into spiritual growth. But the sad thing is, is he misses that second portion. Gideon was more concerned of getting the spoils of victor uh, victories but not the responsibility of one. He took gold and women but did nothing else. When God introduced himself to, Is uh, to Gideon, he addressed him as a man of valor because that is what God had desired for Gideon. He had potential, not because Gideon was great, but God chose him to do these great things. Romans 8.29 says, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Romans 8.32 says, He that spared not his own Son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he then with him also freely give us all things? And Ephesians 2.10 says we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Gideon is an incredible, incredible person to study because he first of all starts off as a coward. And he, he finds that faith, that trust in God. And then not only that, his, his faith is tested and becomes the great man of valor that God had destined for him. And there's I, and I know we, we kind of skip through a lot of the story. We really don't have enough time for one evening to, to read everything that goes through with Gideon. But the sad thing is, is Gideon finally, and he pursues, and he does not give up until the job is done claiming the physical victory in battle. But instead of turning around and leading Israel into having faith, he tries to turn around and take the reward of the, the victory and the spoils and just tries to simply live his life without God in mind at all. I hope this does not be the case with us as Christians. I wonder what giant we're facing right now. And I feel like I'm just facing the giant of, of summer heat in Florida right now. The, the giant of, of embracing having our first kid. We have some challenges that are, are happening in our lives right now. But... I don't want to be a man of cowardice. I don't want to be a man that tucks tail, tail and run. I also don't want to be a man that blames God. I don't want to be a Christian that will force God to prove himself time and time again. We as Christians should be able to take God at his word. 
one thing I can relate to with Gideon is, is I, I tend to be, and I know Amanda gets frustrated with me, I tend to be a little bit tenacious when I have something set as a goal. I don't, I don't let up and I don't give up. And it's something that I can uh, um, admire in a man like Gideon. But what, what, why have that tenacity? If, if I accomplish the goal, turn around and consume it upon my own lust for my own flesh. And that's one of those things that I know I'm, I'm working a lot right now, just trying to provide for our family and get ready for this, this new chapter. But I, I don't want to, I don't want to get ourselves in a good position to, to consume it upon, oh, let's go get a jet ski. Or let's go get a boat. Let's go buy a whole bunch of fishing gear. Now, I want to be wise and follow after what God has planned for us in this chapter of life. Don't, don't forget God in our decisions that we make. Don't forget God when we need to reach down and find some courage. Because in all honesty, we're all men and women of valor. We truly are. The funny thing is, the Word of God calls us, and I always claim this all the time, we are more than conquerors. Have you ever thought of that? God Almighty calls every single one of us in this room more than conquerors. And sometimes I think, man, Napoleon, Alexander the Great, Genghis Khan, men that terrorized nations, those were conquerors. But the funny thing is, is God looks upon those men and looks upon you. He says, you're more than that. You're more than a conqueror. And that's not because Gideon found the strength that he needed, but he relied upon the God that promised to do great things in his life. Let's pray. Lord, I just thank you for what you've done for us today.